because now I want to turn to the health aspects of the World Trade Center dust, uh, which we all know that it was not very healthy to be a first responder or a responder or a worker during the cleanup operation. And it took actually three months to, at least to put out this fire. I call it the longest smoking gun in history. And to walk around there without, without breathing protection surely could not be very healthy. And there are numerous uh, uh, accounts of this. The number of responders has been discussed what I've seen in a medical journal, and the estimate is between 60 to 70,000 of people were exposed to the dust for an extended period of time. And, um, come on, yes. And last year there were published a paper in Experimental Health, Health Perspectives by a group of, of, of doctors from the Mount Sinai a medical school in Manhattan, prestigious science, and they looked into the lung tissue of World Trade Center responders, and uh, we should see what they found. The picture to the left here is from a lung tissue, and they found some thread-like tubular structures in four out of seven patients which were ill, uh, in numbers ranging from 11,000 to 230,000 per gram wet tissue. This is the same material which they found also in the World Trade Center dust, which is moving around here somewhere. And this is a sample of carbon nanotubes, uh, which is shown, it's a completely independent sample, which is shown for comparison. So now I'm introducing a new nanotechnology concept, carbon nanotubes. What are they? Well, they are tubes made of carbon, but they are very, very, very small. Uh, these pictures taken again from another presentation have this space bar here, I think is 100 nanometers. Maybe this close up is better. Well, I, ca I cannot read actually what is that, but but they're very very small. They're made of of, of uh, they can be single walled carbon nanotubes and they can be multiple walled carbon nanotubes. They're very very strong. They're hundreds of times stronger than spider web. They're, they're so strong they're actually a serious project project going out that you can can connect the Earth with a space station via a ladder composed of carbon nanotubes. So you can actually climb 300 kilometers out in space and back again, and some kind of vehicle should go up in it. Very, very strong. These are hot items in nanotechnology because they have a whole range of electrical, chemical, and mechanical properties which are very desirable. And we go back to these findings in the, the nanotubes of, in the World Trade Center lung tissue. The control group here were 14 construction wor workers in old cases. The Mount Sinai, they can go back to the, into their tissue bank and pull out as many patients as they want, uh, diagnosed with uh, asbestos fibrosis, uh, and which meaning these are construction workers which has been exposed to building dust for extended so long time that they actually got too much asbestos, and also 20 healthy non-construction workers. None of them showed the occurrence of carbon nanotubes in the lung tissue. Formation of carbon nanotubes requires three conditions must be fulfilled. You must have very high temperatures, and you must have a, a source of carbon atoms, which means an organic chemical present, and you must have a metal catalyst among which Iron happens to be one of the best besides cobalt. And so this triggered the thought in some of us, well, this means that ignition of the nanothermite should be ideal circumstances for formation of nanotubes. It has taken us some time actually to, to get together and do this experiment but Kevin Ryan just showed you in his backyard how he uh, did ignited the nanothermite. 
he had produced himself. And he sent it to me a couple of weeks ago, and it is here. So this is the residue from Kevin's together with his kind letter, which uh, I can, yeah, I'll just give it to the panelists so they know that, the, no, le let me show it to the audience here. So this is, this is the residue, Kevin, he took, you remember he came in, he took, he took the beaker and you, show, and you saw down into it. Yes. He left it cooling a little bit, he put it into a letter and sent it to me. It is here. And what I did then is to take a little sample out of this, pouring a few milliliters of alcohol, ethanol, onto it, making a slush in a, in a mortar, actually, letting the particles, all the metal particles, all the heavy particles precipitate. And then you take a little drop of, um, of, of the supernatant liquid, you put them onto a copper grid, which the panelists can also see here, they're very, very small, and you let the ethanol evaporate. You put them into a transmission electron microscope, and this is what you see. And that's it. Um, I have, I, I did four, made four samples, they're all here. This is sample number one. And you see exactly the same structures here, and there's no other explanation for, for, for this. This is again sample two here. What you can do, you, we, luckily we can do energy dispersive spectroscopy very locally on this sample, taking on this bend here. It, I know it's hard to see, I haven't had time to do good plots. So let me tell you what you see here is carbon only, and then you see copper, but this is because they're lying on a copper grid. So this is background, nothing else. Most importantly, we do not see any fluorine because the plastic that Kevin used for making this preparation uh, is, is, uh, contains fluorine, meaning that this is not plastic threads. This is, there's nothing else but carbon in it. This is another sample, very, very dilute sample. This is an overview of the copper grid, actually, because we only applied half a drop onto the copper grid. And, and the items here are this one. This is a close-up of one of them. Across here is about one thousandth of a millimeter. These are the dimensions of these chips. This is, uh, this I like in particular, the one here to the left, because, oh, it's not, it's a very unstable, I think. <laughs> I shouldn't have put in a new battery. So th this is, this is the perfect dimensions of carbon nanotube. This is carbon nanotube. I wouldn't, I wouldn't come, obviously, I wouldn't come up with this if I didn't believe what I was saying. This is carbon nanotubes. Again, we're doing energy dispersal spectroscopy. This time, we also see aluminum oxide which is not unexpected. It's a p probably all over. We have to look closer into that. But it is definitely not aluminum oxide which is making on these structures. Aluminum oxide cannot do that. Most important is that there is no fluorine. Uh, and uh, and that, is, that is about it. This is a picture from the patients the Mount Sinai study. This is what we find as a product of the nanothermite reaction. And please remember that none of the control group showed this feature. So if you ask, couldn't the nanotubes come from somewhere else? It's true, it is formed combustion of diesel and, uh, and uh, in much, much smaller amount and in oxygen start fires. But the control group have been living a normal life except that they actually caught uh, asbestos fibers. And they, none of them showed showed um, carbon nanotubes in their lungs.